Welcome, everyone. Um, this is Char my name is Charlie Colstead, and I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you to uh, the Bits and Watts webinar, uh, the, the third of a series on decarbonizing the grid. So, so, so why, in fact, are we focusing on uh, on electricity? Uh, many of you that that's obvious, but uh, decarbonization, after all, is lots of sources, lots of areas that need decarbonizing if we're if we're to reduce the CO two emissions uh, into the atmosphere, greenhouse gas emissions, and there really is quite a, a simple answer to that question, as we see in this this circular graph of, uh, of the source of greenhouse gas emissions by sector in the world, we see that the energy is about three quarters of that. Uh, so that's an obvious reason why we would focus on energy. And uh, electricity is also one of the easiest places to decarbonize. And one can simplify global strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to really two steps. If you do these two steps, you've, get, you've gone a long ways to decarbonizing our economy. So the two steps are, first of all, to electrify energy demand. And this is the, in transportation, this is electric vehicles, and in home heating, this is heat pumps, uh, other sources of heat would be heat pumps. A lot of areas in which one can electrify energy demand. And then secondly, decarbonize the electricity sector. And that's really uh, the primary focus of these webinars is the decarbonization of the electricity sector. And uh, here's, here's a graph that uh, I, I like this graph quite a bit. This is an illustration of for the US, but it could be done in any country is what the nature is of our electricity generation by year the, the generation started in production. So if you note, there's, there's some stuff back in the 1930s and 40s that's still running today, coal, coal fired, small plants. Um, and as you go through, you see this, this is almost like a snake eating a, a piece of coal. You see the coal uh, rising up, that's the darker, bar in the 70s and 80s and sort of tapering off in terms of new construction. The existing plants are still consuming it. In the 1990s, natural gas replacing it. Yeah, very heavy use of natural gas starting at the beginning of this century. And then we see uh, not long after that, uh, renewables, the green, uh, which is wind and solar starting up and really taking off as we move into the last decade, which I guess is the teens. And uh, that brings us to the present. Now this data only goes to 2016, but the pattern is uh, similar, except that a lot more plants have been, uh, coal plants have been retired. So this, this seems pretty simple, decarbonize electricity grid, just put solar on everybody's roof, bunch of windmills up and you're, you're done. But it's not so simple. Electricity is a bundle of three things, energy, uh, power, that's, that's the, the rate at which you're delivering the energy, and particularly reliability. We're so accustomed to turning the switch on, particularly if we live in Europe or, the, or North America, turning the switch on and the lights go on. And that's where the problem lies in decarbonizing with, with renewables. Renewables give us kilowatt hours, but the reliability 24 seven is a problem. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize solar is not working in the middle of the night. Um, electrifying demand also creates reliability problems both locally and system wide. Out here in um, California, it's not uncommon to have a block of houses, each person with an electric vehicle and if all of them charge quickly at one time, which, which happens, there's tremendous uh, uh, stress on the distribution grid. It's not just the system-wide grid. Uh, you, you also have this, what the, what you, this curve that's shown on the right, which is uh, uh, fondly called the duck curve, because that's what it looks like. 
where it shows the belly of the duck sagging and almost going to drag on the ground uh, because that's when a lot of the renewables are operating at, at full uh, speed. And that, that obviously uh, gives us the kilowatt hours, but at the wrong time of day, where the duck's head is and where the duck's tail is, hardly any uh, renewables or, or much less. Then you also have the issue of what happens uh, when the sun begins to go down or the source of, of renewables starts to die down during the day, you need a rapid increase in other sources of energy. Well, this, this creates lots of havoc. With fossil fuels, everything is a lot, lot smoother. Demand is the main source of fluctuations. Okay, so, so uh, the, the solutions as, as we see it, and these are not trivial solutions, um, but the question is how do we decarbonize with reliability? The, the four wings of this uh, solution, and this, these, this is the theme, these are also the themes of our, of our webinars that we've been having. One is to expand interconnection between uh, regional or, or local level. In order, this is just like insurance, uh, in order to take, take into account the fact that fluctuations are occurring differently at different geographic locations. If we can connect them better, then we can buffer those uncorrelated shocks. But in, in many countries, transmission lines are notoriously difficult to permit and construct. And I'll have an example of a solution, a policy solution to that in a minute. Another is storage. If we could just put that solar in our pocket that happens midday and, and pull it out of our pocket in the middle of the night, we'd be home free. Uh, those storage costs are high, a lot of technological progress there, um, and the interface, interface with generation may be difficult. The third is to develop policies to facilitate decarbonization of supply with expanded demand. For instance, a big problem in decarbonization is the coal industry. A lot of jobs, a lot of poor areas involved. Many countries have had the problem of phasing out an industry. The incentives to help phase out coal in a way that helps people uh, can, can do a lot. And then finally, uh, better coordinating demand side flexibility. Us economists always like to price everything. But there are other ways to there are other ways or ways to augment pricing uh, to create demand side flexibility. Okay, so here's here's that example I was talking about. This these are the green is is a the Midwest a power pool in the U.S. and the uh, orange is the PJM power pool. Uh, these are these are relatively big power pools. And the, a lot of the wind is in the Midwest and a lot of the demand is in the PGM area. So how do you construct a long distance transmission line? Well, the one, the policy solution is to go where there are already transmission corridors owned by single entities, and that's the railroad right of ways. And this, this uh, project has is putting a DC, a high voltage DC power line along a right of way from the middle of the Midwest to Chicago, which obviously is a, a valuable and creative solution to this problem. Okay, that, that brings me to our presentations. We're really delighted to have uh, four, four scholars with us here today who are very active in, the, in this area. And I'm going to, uh, introduce each of them um, in turn, and this will be the order in which they'll speak. They'll each speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll follow that by Q&A. So first of all, uh, Professor Steve Bacala, Princeton University. Uh, he's the director of the Carbon Mitigation Initiative there. I, he uh, also is, is a close, has a close connection to Stanford. That's where he he went to the university. Uh, he's also a board of directors at Freeport Institute of Energy, of which Fitz and Watts is part. And uh, he, relevant to, to today's webinar, uh, 
He had chaired the National Research Council, Council National Academy of Sciences recent study, which resulted in a report just a few weeks ago in February entitled Accelerating Decarbonization of the US Energy System. And he'll have some words on that in a minute. But let me introduce everybody before we turn to Steve. Uh, Professor Chris Knittel, uh, he is the director of MIT's Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research, uh, affectionately called CEPR. Now this is MIT's CEPR, which I have to tell the Stanford people, we have a CEPR as well, but it's spelled differently, S-I-E-P-R, Stanford Institute for Energy Policy or Economic Policy Research. The MIT one came first and uh, it's been active for many decades since the 1970s in this, in this area. We're really pleased Chris is joining us. Uh, Professor, Professor Richard Green from uh, across um, a couple of ponds from California, but across the Atlantic in, in London. Uh, he has extensive experience with electricity regulation in, in the UK and uh, is a professor uh, currently at Imperial College Business School, which is part of the University of London, which is a very large university. So many of the colleges in London that we think of as independent schools may be independent, but they're, they're mostly part of the University of London. And then uh, uh, finally, uh, my colleague, Professor Larry Goulder, uh, he is the director of the Stanford Energy and Environmental Policy Analysis Center, which is part of the Stanford CEPR, not the MIT CEPR. And uh, he's had a long history of, of authoring in this area, most recently a book on confront, confronting the climate challenge, options for US policy, uh, published in 2018. So without uh, further ado, let me uh, hand the, uh, the podium over to uh, Professor Bacala. Uh, good uh, morning, everyone, or good day or good evening, depending on where you are. Um, I'm going to be giving what amounts to an abbreviated briefing on um, this report that was released, as, as, as Charles said, on February 2nd. And it's the first of two reports from the National Academies uh, of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, the three academies combined on accelerating decarbonization in the US energy system. The second report will come out in a year. Uh, the scope of this first report is that it's about federal actions over the next 10 years to put the US on, and I wanna emphasize this, a fair and equitable path to net zero emissions in 2050. Now, the fair and equitable piece is unusual for an academy study. So this is about the social factors that are um, involved in the transition. Usually in the US, we throw legacy workers under the bus and move on. But there is um, a substantial discussion on both the right and the left that not to do so um, uh, this time. I can tell you that since releasing this report, in the many, many sessions I've had with Congress and other branches of the federal government, that the two issues that come up the most, it's not cost or anything else or feasibility like you might think. It's number one, what about the fate of the fossil fuel aligned workers? Everybody from you know someone who works in a fossil power plant now to someone who works in a refinery um, uh, and, and so on. And second, what about the environmental injustice that is built into our current energy system? We can't allow that to continue. And this includes, for example, the fact that historically marginalized and lower income Americans are suffer disproportionate exposure to fossil pollution, but get disproportionately low benefits from, from the energy system in exchange. So this, the panel that we put together has at least half social scientists. It's only half sort of technical people. So this is the only, I've been involved in a couple of these now, and this is the only study I know that has as much ink and as thorough a policy portfolio on the social side as it does on implementing the technical side, building the hardware. All right, so 
This report includes just CO2 from transportation, electricity, industry, buildings, and biofuels. We weren't asked to determine whether or not the nation should move to net zero, only how to get there, and other greenhouse gases and sinks created by um, nature-based solutions, forestry and cropping practices aren't discussed in detail in this report, but will be in the next, and it's broadly compatible with recent announcements from the Biden administration, but it was developed by a panel uh, independently. Now, I wanna turn immediately to the key findings and recommendations from the report. I won't have time um, to uh, provide you with all of these, but I can orient you around a web resource that I'll show you the address to in a second um, that will allow you to understand everything in the report really quickly. It's a reconfigurable table that has everything that we recommended uh, in it. I wanna say that we did try and I think succeeded in reading everything that was written uh, on this subject, certainly in recent years and took testimony from most of the uh, studies that were in, in progress. Now, the, um, the, the technical side of the recommendations are organized around five different technology goals, um, each uh, uh, signified by a different icon, and the icons turn out to be important. And, and each icon, each, each, each technology goal also has a long list of quantitative targets associated with it. So the lightning bolt is, um, as Charlie just said, electrify energy services and transportation buildings and industry. And an example includes moving half of vehicle sales, all classes combined, to EVs by 2030 or deploying heat pumps in a quarter of residences. I should say also that this first report focuses only on the first 10 years of a 30 year transition. So these are the federal policies that would be needed to be enacted like pronto to get through the first 10 years of a 30 year transition. So this target is for, is for the 2020s, all right? So by 2030, you'd wanna have half of vehicle sales, all classes combined BEPs. The, the um, light bulb with a leaf in the middle of it is improve energy efficiency and productivity. And there's a whole list of targets associated with this. Um, uh, probably, well, the most, the, the biggest efficiency gains come actually from electrification of, of vehicles and, uh, and heating. Uh, the the uh, wind turbine and the solar panel means increase the production of carbon-free electricity. Uh, we need to roughly double the share of electricity generated from carbon-free sources in 2030 to around 75%. The little gears driving ever bigger gears uh, means expanding the innovation toolkit. We need to triple federal support for net zero rd and That tripling is not a generic top-down tripling. That's a bottom-up analysis. Most of the technology that we need for this transition and all of it that we need for the next 10 years is already in the quiver. But there are sectors that include, you know, industrial sectors like cement production and steel and transportation sectors like aviation and and shipping where, uh, where solutions are still pre-commercial. And so we need um, a big expansion in our d, &D to bring those, um, those technologies in, much the way that public policy um, made wind and solar the cheapest uh, levelized source of electricity um, of, of any source uh, over the last 30 years. The transmission tower means that we need to plan, permit, and build critical infrastructure including new transmission lines, an EV charging network, and a CO2 pipeline network, which is necessary even if you're shooting for a 100% renewable system in the end. I should also say that one of the uh, encouraging things that we discovered by looking at all of the different paths to decarbonization is that the actions that you need during the 2020s are essentially independent of the makeup of the net zero energy system in 2050, be it 100% renewable or retaining substantial amounts of, say, nuclear and fossil with CCS. So this is a fight we don't have to have now. Uh, we also have four socioeconomic goals. The American flag means strengthen the U.S. economy. Um, we have policies to uh, reinvigorate uh, U.S. manufacturing to protect export exposed businesses from a carbon price early on. 
and to try to increase employment, particularly of uh, blue collar jobs. The community with the road through it is a proactive support of those adversely and directly affected by the transition. We have a portfolio of policies designed in fact to proactively address uh, job losses and other disruptions and, and uh, to come and also to distribute benefits um, um, uh, even uh, uh, fairly and, and also to allow communities to participate in that planning. Uh, the people holding hands is promotion of equity and inclusion to ensure an equitable distribution of benefits, risks and costs and so on. And the piggy bank um, means maximize cost effectiveness, all else equal. So the, the policy recommendations, there are 30 and they're in a single table. And the table is available at that uh, website. And if the, if the organizers of the uh, webinar could post that on the chat that everyone can see, that would be great. The first column shows the policy. The next column shows the icon, the technology goal that the policy is intended to address. Uh, the color of the icon, uh, the darker it is, the more essential that policy is to achieve that goal. The next column is the socioeconomic goals. The next one is the government entity responsible for the, uh, executing the policy. The next one is the appropriation, if any, that is needed for the policy and before anyone asks. Without revenues from a price on carbon, these policies total $350 billion in appropriations cumulatively over the next 10 years. And finally, there's a note section. So there's lots more in footnotes and so on. But if you go to this website and look at this table, you can click on the various icons and it will give you a custom table specifically targeting a specific goal. So if you um, uh, click on the transmission tower, it'll show you all of the policies in, a, in prioritized order required to build the infrastructure, all right? So I'm gonna show you 12 of the 30 policies in the um, uh, uh, four minutes I think I have left. Uh, we recommend that the US adopt uh, a formal emissions budget that is granular by sector. Uh, you need other policies, obviously, to enforce this, but without a, an emissions budget going to zero, uh, we won't know where we are. We recommend an economy-wide price on carbon starting at $40 a ton and rising at 5% per year. Um, uh, we also recommend additional policies to soften the impact of this on low-income groups and also to soften the impact on export exposed, import-export exposed businesses. But 40 bucks a ton, even so, isn't enough to do the full transition. To do one of these transi transitions, you have to replace long-lived capital stock as it ages out. And some of it ages out immediately. And some of those initial replacements with a non-emitting alternative or with an alternative that is easily retrofit are expensive. And so we didn't propose a carbon price large enough to do the full transition because there isn't an economics literature that shows you how to do that in a fair and equitable way. The literature kind of tops out at about 40 bucks a ton. So that's where we ended. Uh, we uh, propose a national transition task force to assess the vulnerability. The literature on who's going to be hurt by a transition is not complete and we need a formal census and assessment. Uh, we propose a formal uh, office uh, in the White House to track how equitable the energy transition is, to monitor progress, and to enforce it across the federal government. This goes beyond the office that the Biden administration has recently uh, announced. If you want to keep from leaving legacy workers under the bus, and if you want to fix what's unfair in the current energy system, we need eyes on this at the top and a serious effort. We propose a national transition corporation, which is the primary source of aid to communities that need it, all right, that want to attract a, 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 an alternative business to a fossil employer they're going to lose, that want retraining and that sort of thing. We also propose 10 regional centers that um, uh, coordinate planning and administer block grants to communities with technical assistance from other branches of the federal government so that they can plan and anticipate and know what to propose to this national transition corporation. 
We proposed a green bank capitalized at $60 billion uh, by 2030 uh, to free up the capital that is required where our current capital markets aren't designed uh, for the transition. Uh, we need to a comprehensive set of education and training programs that you can read about. As I said before, we need a tripling of net zero RD and D. And we also propose a series of standards because 40 bucks a ton isn't enough for the full, for the full transition. Uh, a clean electricity standard designed to reach 75% of zero emissions electricity by 2030. We also propose regulatory reforms to be able to cite the transmission for these facilities. And these is absolutely critical. Without those, you're not gonna do it. You're gonna end up with CO2 pipelines and decarbonized fossil if you wanna to get to net zero or nukes if you don't figure out how to cite the electricity transmission. We need standards for zero emissions vehicles and we need standards, manufacturing standards for zero emissions appliances, including heat pumps um, uh, uh, in buildings. So the full report is available uh, at the top website, the policy table is at the middle one, and there's also an interactive summary at the bottom one. And I think I have, because I started late, I think I have uh, one minute, so I'm going to use it to give you one finding that surprised me. This is the fraction of GDP in the U.S. that the U.S. has spent on its energy system since 1970. And there we are currently. And these are predictions about the transition to net zero that are now in the literature from studies and alongside uh, some business as usual trajectories. And the important take home is this, to transition to net zero, the US economy will have to spend a smaller fraction of its GDP over the next 30 years than it has over the last 30 years. And so by this metric, that's affordable. It does require a lot of capital, but that capital requirement is not a cost in the same way that, um, you know, any capital, its operating costs also matter, right? So, so uh, renewable electricity has high capital costs, but it's got a lower levelized cost of electricity right now because, um, because you don't have to pay for fuel once you've built it to make electricity. Um, finally, um, this is a jobs Predict, uh, jobs analysis for predicted job losses and gains in every state. If you look at this carefully, there are exactly, I think, five states with even transient losses in jobs. That's West Virginia. You can see the coal jobs disappearing. So the employment picture here is restricted regionally, and I think is perhaps possible to address by policy where we might locate industrial hubs in places that are gonna lose particularly oil and gas jobs, like down here on the Gulf Coast or up here in the Northern Midwest. So I'll leave you with that and turn the mic over to the next speaker. Thank you, Steve. Chris. Great. Well, thanks for having me. Um, and in, in a remarkable twist, uh, my presentation is gonna be actually quite uh, consistent with the proposals that Steve just made. Um, it's going to be different in the sense that I'm going to do a little bit of a deeper dive into uh, two of the policies that Steve mentioned, and, and in particular, a dive into mixing those two, and that's a clean energy standard or a renewable portfolio standard with a carbon tax. Um, and I'll be discussing some recent work of my own um, out, of, out of, as Charlie said, the MIT Center for Energy and Environmental Policy Research. Um, so I really have one goal in, in my 15 minutes, and, and that's to convince you that policy choices matter. Um, and you're already at a webinar about policy choices and decarbonization. So I guess to, to sharpen that goal, it's to convince you that they really matter. Um, and they really matter in, uh, across two spectrums and that I'm going to focus on. Um, it, they matter in other ways as well, but I'm going to focus on economic efficiency and the distributional impacts of, of those policies. And, and like I said, this is drawing from three recent papers of mine that I put here in case you want to uh, dive deeper in, 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 into the analysis. Um, so first, in terms of what does the economics literature tell us uh, in, in terms of policy choices, well, it, it already tells us that policy choices really matter. So um, I'm really replicating a lot of literature that's already been done. Um, 
and to put numbers to it, um, a lot of a lot of work has been done, for example, in the transportation sector, looking at how how you can get reductions in carbon emissions uh, through either a fuel economy standard or a carbon tax. And Larry's done some great work in this arena as well. And that literature suggests that these alternatives to a price on carbon are often as much as 10 times more expensive uh, than, than uh, getting those reductions from a price on carbon. And that's on an apples to apples basis. So um, it's this either starting at the same point and getting to the same point uh, using standards can often be 10 times more expensive than a carbon tax. And we actually see that in data right now, since I'm presenting in California, I took these data, uh, recent data from California. Right now, California has two policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from transportation. One is a low carbon fuel standard and one is the cap and trade. And the low carbon fuel standard prices are trading at about 10 times uh, the cap and trade prices. So now what I want to do is transition from transportation and, and think about what this means in the electricity market. Um, and look, I'm not an ivory tower sitting person that ignores the politics. I understand that carbon taxes or a price on carbon is a heavy lift politically. Uh, I view my job as educating policymakers as to what the trade-off is. So they can obviously do the trade-off in terms of the politics of, of putting their weight behind a price on carbon or a clean energy standard. I can't do that for them, but what I can do them is do for them is tell them what they're giving up if they're uh, moving from a price on carbon to a clean energy standard. Um, and that's, again, what I view my job as being in this front. Um, some of my recent work, though, has been getting at what's something that Steve brought up, which is we might think we want both. So not only do we want a price on carbon, but we might be worried that that price on carbon might not be large enough to, to get us all the way to where we want to be. So we can augment that with a clean energy standard. Or conversely, we might all think we're going to have a clean energy standard. We might also want to know what the marginal benefit or what the benefit of a small marginal carbon taxes on top of that clean energy standard. And that's uh, the topic of a recent paper with Emil Demanchev. Uh, that, that I'm going to show you some graphs from. So we do replicate the existing literature there showing how much cheaper it would be if we did everything via a, a price on carbon. Um, but unlike the, the literature, we also look at in-between cases. Um, and the punchline, just to jump to that, is a wimpy carbon tax goes a long way in terms of cost reductions. So you can get a significant amount of cost reductions from just having a little bit of a carbon pricing on top of that clean energy standard or a renewable portfolio standard or, or whatever uh, electricity standard you want. Um, so what we focus on here is this the, the middle case here, where, as Steve mentioned, we might have a $40 price on carbon. That's not enough. So we need, to, we need a 100% clean energy standard on top of that or a 75% clean energy standard. And the way we're going to do this is use two models that we have at MIT. Um, one is the, the first one is an economy wide model uh, run out of the MIT's joint program for global change. And that's, a, if you're familiar with the term, an integrated assessment model. So it has a model of the uh, macro economy, it has a model of the climate um, at a very large scale uh, uh, over, over hundreds of years. Um, and then the second is uh, MIT's um, effectively resource planning model for electricity markets, and that's called Gen X. Uh, and we've been developing that over the last decade or so. Um, so this is a highly resolved electricity model where we have hourly electricity demand over, over uh, an entire year's worth of electricity demand. And the model is optimizing the mix of technology uh, to invest in to get to a certain carbon goal, um, meeting all of the constraints of the transmission and distribution system inside of the model. Uh, our results are for New England, but we've run this model for ERCOT, California, uh, PJM, and, and other markets as well. Um, so before I show you the results, just really quickly, where are the benefits coming from, from carbon pricing? 
And this is going to vary depending on which model we focus on. So because the EPA model is an economy-wide model, um, it can find the least cost carbon reductions outside of the electricity sector as well. So that's, that's one. That's going to be shut off in the Gen X model because Gen X is just looking at the electricity sector. The big or the second big benefit of carbon pricing is, as everyone knows, as you start to really decarbonize, the marginal cost of that incremental decarbonization gets really steep, um, especially after about 90%. You know, that hockey stick cost curve starts to shoot up. So what a price on carbon does when you're adding it to a clean energy standard is allow for demand reductions and allow us to not have to travel as high up, as far up that hockey stick uh, as we otherwise would. And then the third uh, depends on what alternative you're thinking about. Um, and in particular, imagine a clean energy standard versus a renewable portfolio standard. How are they different? Well, typically the clean energy standard allows for nuclear and the RPS doesn't. So um, a carbon price um, on top of a renewable portfolio standard uh, might incentivize more nuclear tech, nuclear facilities to stay online um, absent any additional policy. So here's the punchline. Um, so what I, and let me explain this here. So what, what this is, is the here is the costs associated with getting fully decarbonizing the grid only through a, a renewable portfolio standard. These next dots here, are, well, what if we only get used 95% or only use the RPS to decarbonize 95% of the way there and, and added a carbon tax to get the rest of the 5%. And the y-axis is the relative costs of doing that. So what we find is that just backing off a little and relying on a price on carbon for that last 5%, reduces costs by as much as 65% relative to doing everything through a renewable portfolio standard. And the marginal benefits of relying on carbon pricing wane because as you go down that hockey stick, the marginal benefits of going down that hockey stick gets smaller and smaller. So this, what this suggests is AOC's wimpy carbon tax actually has a lot of power, that we can cut the cost of decarbonization in half by just having a little bit of carbon pricing on top of a renewable portfolio standard or a clean energy standard. So the, the I'll just tell you for the Gen X economy-wide model, it, it looks very similar there because it has transportation, we can look at uh, fuel economy standards versus carbon pricing as well, um, but the the, end result is a little bit of carbon pricing goes a long way. Let me um, end my last uh, couple minutes here talking about equity. So some other recent work that um, I've done, and this is actually the wrong paper. Um, I, I can put the correct paper in the chat. Um, but as part of a, a research initiative between MIT and Harvard, led by Ernie Moniz, um, we've been looking at a just transition and how to, how to do just like Steve mentioned, which is how can we transition the economy without leaving certain groups behind? And as part of that work, one of my uh, papers looks at carbon footprints across the US at a very fine geographic area. So we look at average carbon footprints uh, for a census track and there's 75,000 census tracks across the US. And what you get is a very striking picture. So these are average total household carbon footprints uh, for all of those 75,000 census tracts. And what, you, what jumps out at you here is that the middle of the US has very high carbon footprints. And, I, and we're, we're both on the coast, we sort of understand that already. But what that means is that we, be, we have to be very careful how we decarbonize because a lot of that burden might fall on the shoulders of middle America. And politically, that, to me at least, suggests it's not going to happen. And even if it does happen, uh, it's, it's 
our mission to 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 keep it from uh, adversely affecting middle America relative to the coast. Now, what this also means is that suppose we did have a price on carbon, if we just and I think the most popular price on carbon would be a, a, a tax and dividend plan where we would generate a bunch of revenue and send it back to the households on a per household basis. Well, what this picture means is a lot of money under that plan would flow from middle America to the coast because middle America would be taxed more uh, on average and the coast would be taxed less. So the coast would make money and the middle America would be spending money. And that's what we show in the paper. Um, but what we also show is that you can adapt how you structure the dividends to guard against that. So it, the top graph there is um, our preferred carbon tax and dividend plan where the dividend checks depend on whether you're in an urban environment or a rural environment and also vary across the 10 census regions in the US to guard against that the money flowing from middle America to the coast. But what I also wanna stress is the carbon tax on an equity framework is much better than the alternatives. Why? Because you generate money and you could actually undo some of the things that you don't want to see happen. Whereas a clean energy standard doesn't generate any money. So if you had a national clean energy standard that was just based on a uh, household's uh, carbon content of their electricity, that too is gonna send a bunch of money from middle America to, to the coast, and there's gonna be no revenue generated to undo those effects. So I, what I've been trying to educate policymakers on is that it's true that a carbon tax can be regressive um, and can be unequitable from, from many standpoints, but, it generates money so you can undo those things if you if you uh, if you wanted to. So just wrapping up, um, what we've shown in recent work is carbon pricing has huge efficiency benefits and distributional benefits. But another thing that we want to stress is that a little bit of carbon taxing uh, goes a long way. And that's it, Charlie. Thanks. All right, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, I love your choice of position on the screen too down in the corner. Um, our next speaker is Richard Green. I guess I'm the token view from Europe. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and I'm Imperial College Business School. Imperial College London is effectively the UK equivalent of MIT. A full, we are actually a full university because we declared independence from the University of London and give our own degrees a few years back. Uh, but I think the University of London still exists in some sort of nominal form. They just don't have any power. Uh -huh. That's a good way to keep central university administrations. So anyway, uh, given that 52% of my electorate thought I shouldn't be allowed to speak for Europe, I'm actually only speaking uh, for Britain. And I was at an event at another place in the Bay Area that I suspect I'm not really allowed to name uh, yesterday and saw from that that uh, US electricity emissions have gone down 25% in the last few years, which is pretty good. Uh, I'm afraid ours have managed to come down quite a lot more than that, uh, particularly over the last eight years or so. Uh, we, like you, had a, a dash for gas. Yours was in the early noughties. Ours was in the 90s. And so that helped get rid of some of the, uh, our emissions. And if you asked the average member of the great British public, what have we been doing to electricity recently? The data go from 1990 to 2019. I think that may... I think the rest will probably be okay, although you'll miss uh, a couple of references. Uh, so if you asked an average member of the Great British Public, what have we done to electricity? The question would probably, they'd probably say, well, we built a lot of renewables, wind farms and solar panels, but actually a whole range of other policies have gone up. And it's a potentially interesting question to disentangle them. And the standard way would be to run a model and say, well, what if we hadn't had renewables? Or what if we hadn't had a carbon tax? But the problem is if you add renewables to a policy to an electricity system that's almost entirely fossil, 
it will have a big impact. If you add a carbon tax to a system with no renewables, it will have a big impact, but you shouldn't really do the double counting. So what Ian Stefel and myself have done looking between 2012 and 2019 has actually been, firstly, we took account of the, fact of the small change in the weather because uh, 2019 was a little bit of warmer in the winter, so less heating, less demand, perhaps a bit sunnier, perhaps a bit windier, so more renewable output, and therefore slightly lower emissions, even if nothing else had changed. And then we calculate Shapley values, looking at all the other things that could have changed, but looking at the marginal contribution in all the different orders that they might have happened. So our fossil capacity changed. Uh, we started by reducing coal capacity, not to deal with carbon emissions, but to reduce emissions of sulfur dioxide, the EU's large combustion plant directive. We subsidized some stations to convert from coal to biomass, drawing their biomass, I believe, mostly from the United States, and then some other coal stations have since closed. We also added a lot of subsidized renewable capacity. Offshore wind has grown a lot recently, onshore wind less significant and earlier on. Solar PV has also grown quite a lot of gigawatts, but not nearly so many terawatt hours. We have had two carbon prices. The European Emissions Trading System started up in 2005, and this is the incremental effect between 2012 and 2019. By 2019, it was actually at a sensible level, but for most of the period, it wasn't very high. And we then had our own UK carbon price floor added on, on top of that, which had a decent impact on emissions. Fuel prices, Coal got a bit cheaper, which was bad news. Gas got a lot cheaper, which was good news in terms of emissions. And then our demand has fallen, partly because the British economy keeps not doing very well. And this was before we got to 2020, of course, and COVID. Uh, partly because of policies to promote energy efficiency. And so that has a, a, about 20 million tonnes worth of emissions reductions. We have also increased our imports by building new interconnectors and using them more intensively, partly because the carbon price, the British carbon price made our fuel price, our electricity price go up and therefore makes importing from a country that doesn't have it more attractive. We're using national carbon accounting, which means that emissions don't count if they're over the border, but actually the European systems we're importing from aren't particularly high carbon. France has an awful lot of nuclear power. And so the impact isn't that huge. And then unfortunately, we have been shutting some of our nuclear stations. So that's moved in the wrong direction. But basically, we have had a large number of different overlapping policies, and they've all had quite an effect. And of course, in a similar vein to Chris's presentation, you could ask, well, did you need them all? Could you just have had one instrument? And it's been suggested to us that all we really needed was a carbon price. And for that, I'd like to sort of use a version of a, a diagram that comes from uh, Michael Grubb of University College London again says it's a college, but it's a full size university. And he points out that where you want firms in particular to make optimizing economic price, price choices to get to cleaner products, cleaner processes, then markets and prices are a very good way to get there. So the carbon tax works for getting electricity companies to switch between coal and gas stations. On the other hand, and I say this comes from uh, the book Planetary Economy Economics, which is Michael Grubb plus uh, Christian, I think, Hurkard and Carsten Neuhoff. Uh, and so it's a nice presentation, but they point out that there are actually three domains of decision making. 
So ways in which we make decisions, types of policies, and what we're trying to get from them. And while firms may make optimizing economic choices quite a lot of the time, there are other decision makers, us, who very often just make satisfying behavioral choices. You won't buy the energy efficient fridge, particularly if you don't actually know it's more efficient. You won't buy the low energy light bulbs, even though they're going to save you a lot of money over their lifetime. And Michael has a very good story in the book about how long it took him to insulate his loft and cut his energy bills that way, even though at the time he was the chief economist for the main UK policy body charged with delivering energy efficiency. And then that's not enough. We also need to transform our infrastructure so some very significantly different investment choices, some of them using technologies that don't really exist yet. And so for those choices, Michael suggests markets and prices will do a little, but not that much. So Michael suggests that standards intelligently designed, so not necessarily completely overlapping uh, fuel standards or sort of perhaps vehicle economy standards, which I believe don't actually count sports utility vehicles, if I've got that one right, and forgive me if I haven't. Uh, they can do a lot to help people make smarter choices, and they'll help a bit with the economic choices. They probably won't do much on investment, and then strategic investment policy, research and development, demonstrator projects, support for the early wave of a new, any new technology, such as uh, some of the renewable uh, generators, that will help transform the innovation and the infrastructure. So that is someone else's framework, but I think it's a good answer for why you do need a mix, whether it's the standards and the investment to supplement your carbon price, or whether, as Chris was saying, it's the carbon price to supplement uh, the standards for renewables. So on that, I'll thank you. I'll give you the reference uh, for my own joint work that was most of what I was talking about, and I'll hand over to other people. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. So we'll, our last speaker, um, Larry Goulder, I'll hand it over to you. I think this has been a terrific set of presentations already and uh, appreciate being able to contribute. Uh, to to uh, expand the geographical scope, I'm going to be talking mostly about decarbonization in China and lead off by indicating an announcement made last September by Xi Jinping, saying that China will aim to have CO2 emissions peak before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. Well, how serious are they about that and will they get there? First, uh, as you probably know, China now has the invidious distinction of being the world leader in CO2 emissions reflecting its very, very significant economic growth over the past decades. Uh, also, uh, it's now contributing a very large share of global CO2 emissions. This is from 2020. Um, over a quarter of the emissions CO2 come from China. And where are those emissions in China coming from? A large fraction, almost half are coming from the power sector. So if we want to talk about electricity and you want to talk about decarbonizing, focusing on China's power sector is a relevant place to focus. Um, what about that power sector? Where are the emissions coming from? Well, this chart uh, indicates that a large fraction of the CO2 emissions from the power sector in China are coming from coal. They, as you know, very reliant on coal-fired electric, electricity generation. And as we'll see, they're still constructing a significant number of new power plants that are coal-reliant. Um, 
<clears throat> China is, despite making a lot of progress, it still remains very carbon intensive compared to the rest of the world on average. It uh, generates about one megaton of CO2 emissions per thousand dollars of GDP. And that that's much higher, it's about 60% uh, higher than the global average. So there's a lot of ways, way to go, but at the same time, there's a lot of opportunity. So I'm gonna be focusing on this. Some of my own research in recent years has focused on some innovative approaches that China is taking to reduce CO2 emissions. And overall, I'm actually encouraged. So what are they doing? How can they get there? Well, they've introduced very recently, within the last few years, it's just now being implemented, a emissions trading system, which will stand to make very significant uh, reductions. Uh, it's um, a nationwide emissions trading system. It, because it has the word trade in it, it's sort of gonna harness market forces. And because it's nationwide, it has the prospect of exploiting or picking the low hanging fruit because it's very broad in its base. It's expected to be the largest in the world once it's fully implemented. It will more than double CO2 covered by emissions pricing worldwide after full implementation. It could contribute to about half of China's CO2 emissions reductions. It's not the only measure, but it's a very important measure. And it basically succeeds what had been since 2011, seven municipal or regional pilot programs um, and now it's we're, we're moving to nationwide. I'm going to focus on impacts from my own work in the initial phase, which is just starting up now and will last about two, two and a half years, which concentrates uh, on the power sector and covers about 2,000 power plants, basically virtually all of the power plants uh, in, in China. But this program will later expand to cover um, basically most of the industrial sectors uh, in China uh, cover eight large industrial sectors, most in terms of uh, actual amount of production. So what's China's approach? We've all heard of emissions trading, but it's not gonna be cap and trade. It is a different approach. It's a tradable performance standard, which is an intensity-based approach. It basically to meet the standard to comply the ratio of emissions, let's say of a power plant to its production of electricity, that ratio has to be below some ceiling. It's not a constraint on absolute emissions, it's a constraint on the ratio. That makes a whale of a difference. So it's not cap and trade. And, to, and recognize what that implies is that under cap and trade, except in some cases like output-based allocation, basically the the covered facilities face a fixed cap. They have to keep their emissions in absolute amount within a compliance period below some given number. In the case of a TPS, tradable performance standard, it's different. Now what counts is keeping the ratio be be below some number. So your absolute emissions are not controlled and this has powerful implications. Let me just explain in words what that means. What the regulators do is they set these things called benchmarks, which is for different classes of technologies. They select what they feel should be the ceiling or the emissions output ratio that is justifiable, that is needed for compliance. Those benchmarks can differ by facility or by type of technology. And what this means is that then the regulators in each compliance period, they see how much electricity is produced by a given generator of a given technology type. And they say, okay, given that amount of electricity, here's the amount of emissions you're entitled to so that your emissions and output ratio would be within compliance. If you don't have enough, if you have too much emissions, well, then you have to buy some allowances or you have to figure out a way of reducing the intensity. So the key thing here is, and I mentioned it here a little bit more mathematically, but this is basically the idea, is that if, once the benchmark is chosen, a firm can affect how many allowances it gets by the amount of output it has. What's really critical is the ratio of emissions to output, not the um, absolute emissions. And um, this has profound implications, I would argue, and some simulation results suggest that's the case, that relative to cap and trade, very different implications. Um, 
Okay. I also, in sort of in the spirit of talking about fairness, which was an issue that Steve brought up, and also Richard, um, and indeed, uh, um, so did, so did um, Chris. Um, this choice of benchmarks is really m much based on political considerations. If there's politically powerful power plants that are highly energy or emissions intensive, they get oftentimes more relaxed benchmarks, that is higher standards or higher ceilings. Whereas um, in other places, the ceilings are, are tighter. And so this is often predicated by political considerations and some considerations of fairness. Choice of benchmarks is very important. So there's strengths and limitations of this approach. The limitation is I'll, I'll try to demonstrate in a moment is that it's less cost effective. And the reason is, in, intuitively, it's this. One of the ways under cap and trade that you can reduce emissions is by reducing your output, reducing your level of production, say your level of electricity. That can help keep you within, you won't have to buy as many allowances. In the case of the TPS, in a sense, you lose something by reducing your output as a way of complying. You don't get as many allowances because allowances are, for a given intensity, proportional to your output. And that means that it's less cost effective because the channel of reducing emissions that's employed more effectively under cap and trade, namely reducing the quantity of intended output, isn't exploited as much. On the other hand, there are several attractions. Uh, there's an implicit subsidy to output under the TPS. And as a result, electricity prices tend to be a little lower and that's a powerful issue politically in China. Better for electricity consumers less leakage because electricity prices go up less, it's less likely to lead to higher levels of output elsewhere in other jurisdictions, which would contravene the intended effect, which is to reduce emissions. Also, because it's an intensity approach, the business cycle, there's kind of an automatic adjustment. If the economy is booming and electricity production is really high, that doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna be out of compliance as long as you keep your emissions output ratio at the right level. Whereas under cap and trade, in boom times, you increase your output, you're going to hit much harder against that fixed constraint. There's also the issue of familiarity in that in China, they're used to focusing on intensities, on ratios. In fact, their five-year plans are often in terms of uh, pollution per unit of GDP. So there are attractions as well. What I want to just show you quickly is what difference it might make relative to cap and trade. And although I'll mention some liabilities here of the TPS relative to cap and trade, else I just want to suggest I think this is a major step forward, broad-based, economy-wide, exploiting market forces. I think it's very exciting. But anyway, under the TPS, you notice that only about a quarter of the emissions reductions, and this is for um, the year 20 um, in, our, in our benchmark here, 2020. The, only about a quarter of the reductions are accomplished by reduced output. Over half is accomplished by reduced, reduced heat rates or lowered emissions intensities. Now, all of these things need to contribute, but it's relatively less efficient. Because in contrast, under cap and trade, about three quarters of the reduction of a comparable cap and trade system with the same scope and the same stringency, about a quarter of it's coming through reduced output, which is more efficient way to go. And much less is coming through lowered heat rates or emissions intensities. And that translates into what you see here, where in a numerical model, a computer model, that also generated the, the results in the pie chart just before, what we see is that under the TPS for any given amount of emissions reduction, and that's gonna depend on the benchmarks, how strict they are, it's gonna be, uh, according to our calculations, almost twice as costly or even slightly more costly to do it under the TPS relative to cap and trade. Uh, for some of you who, who might detect that there's a, there's a nuance here, which I've ignored, which is that some cap and trade resembles the TPS in that it has so-called output-based allocation. That's usually a small part of a cap and trade system, but to the extent the cap and trade has that, it's going to resemble more TPS, and this, this line here will have to be shifted up. So I've, in a way, put cap and trade in its best light the way I've described it here. But big difference, and this is this, the, the stringency, let's see if I can get the pointer to look, 
This is what uh, seems implied by the benchmarks that the Chinese planners are now considering. And one thing to mention is it's only going to imply, and I guess this got a little bit out of the out of sync. Um, this 4.9% or 134 million ton reduction, that's the reduction in the central case, which is you know a step forward, but it's not exactly a huge reduction over the next two, three years. Um, so China would have to ramp up quite a lot in order to get down to the 2060 target. So that raises the last thing I want to focus on my last two or three minutes. What more is needed? Well, just put this in context. China is continuing to commission a lot of additional coal-fired capacity, even up through 2020. Uh, in some sense, more than much of the rest of the world. So what's going to happen? And here are the BAU. Here's the projections for 2050. Compared to what would happen if we continue on a BAU path, coal is going to have to be reduced quite a lot relative to current. How will it get there? Well, the TPS does encourage renewables. So maybe one thing we have to think about is renewables. It already does that by raising the cost of fossil. But the TPS is going to have to be a lot more stringent in order to get anywhere near or even to approach the 2060 goal. China is also directly promoting renewables uh, by a, a couple of ways. One is by purchase guarantees for renewables-based generators to the extent uh, that they're concerned about whether there's actually a market. They can be guaranteed of it, uh, the demand. There's also a compensation for those renewables-based generators like wind and solar, solar, some of whom have faced curtailments. There's financial compensation. Importantly, other direct approaches for renewables have been scaled back since 2014, like feed-in tariffs and direct subsidies for solar and wind. Why scaled back? Political pressure. Because the extent that solar is making a serious inroads in certain regions or provinces, it's affecting the price of electricity by basically discouraging what's cheaper, at least on a private cost basis, which is fossil-based electricity. And China's been uneasy about that. So they've actually scaled back a number of their renewables-based policies that are direct, which is a little worrisome, but it's politically understandable. There's a lot of pressure to keep electricity prices low in particular provinces. And that's hampering renewables promotion because renewables are seen as a way of basically causing prices to be, to be higher because it's taking away uh, the potential at the margin for more of the fossil-based fuels, fossil-based generation. So I leave you with sort of the last questions here. Should, and, uh, should China resurrect strong direct subsidies to renewables to get there? Um, and um, I'll offer two answers. One is, well, no, um, it'd be redundant. They have these other policies. And, and we also are indirectly encouraging renewables through the TPS itself. So this is sort of the question of redundancy that previous talks today have already talked about. But um, then there's also um, the, the counter argument that yes, it is justified in the sense that renewables might address other market failures, might encourage learning by doing more. It might encourage in other respects, uh, technological change that wouldn't occur otherwise. So that would argue for ramping up. So I think a major question going forward is, is not simply going to be how much the TPS will become more aggressive, will become more stringent, which it will. It's only counting for small reductions now in CO2. But the other question is, to what extent China is going to focus more direct, directly on renewables, something that in some ways it has scaled back on in recent years for political reasons. So thanks for the opportunity. Thanks very much, Larry. Uh, and actually all the presenters and uh, we're, we're right on time. Uh, so what, what we're well, I have a few questions that I'd like to pose to, to different people. And we, we're getting some questions coming in through q and I'll turn to those uh, in just a few minutes. Uh, so let, let, me, let me address the first one to Larry, just following up on, <clears throat> on your presentation while it's still fresh in our mind. Um, you, know, you, you spent a lot of time talking about the rate-based um, uh, trading system in the, in the form of 
tradable performance standards uh, instead of cap and trade. And uh, you also mentioned that it had some efficiency problems. Can, can you talk a, a little, little more about why one might actually choose a, uh, a tradable performance standard rather than cap and trade as, as we here in the rest of the world uh, set out to set up our own systems and uh, Chinese experience can be valuable. Yeah, sure, Charlie. Uh, I also say, by the way, that Chinese planners at least have mentioned that they put under consideration the possibility of morphing to a cap and trade system over some, some years. But I think there are a couple of reasons. One is that the Chinese are used to intensity standards. Uh, again, their, their five year plans are usually described in terms of intensity. Secondly, the planners are often, uh, hope I'm not insulting anyone out there, but often have kind of an engineering focus. And in a way, it's, it's a little bit easier to kind of think of things in terms of just getting intensities down rather than these newfangled approaches that have no assurance in some sense, you might think under cap and trade, what's gonna to happen to intensities. Um, and then there are also these other reasons. One is that the intensity approach will, because of the implicit output subsidy, it will imply smaller increases in electricity prices. And uh, that can help reduce potential leakage. And it also can have some distributional effects which some might favor, which is to prevent electricity prices from, from going up as much. And I mentioned that that issue has also helped to explain why China in some ways has scaled back on direct subsidies to, um, to renewables. So I think for all these reasons, there are attractions. My own feeling is it's a pretty nice half of a loaf. Uh, and it's, I think it's a very welcome step. And um, I've been encouraged that despite a lot of the tensions between the US and China, uh, the Chinese planners are really pushing forward very much on this, very much dedicated to this, and are continuing to uh, take advice from outsiders uh, like myself as to uh, the, um, the design. I'll just mention one anecdote. Originally, they thought they would go with 11 different benchmarks, which would be very useful for dealing with fairness or distributional issues that gives you more flexibility. But more recent research has indicated that if you have that many benchmarks, it's highly inefficient. Now they've scaled it down, they're probably going to go to three or four benchmarks. So it's very um, exciting to me that they're committed and that um, they are taking advice from the international, uh, outs from, from others outside of China. That's a really, very nice collaboration. Yeah, we should, we should remember that George Bush, the junior, uh, first turned to performance standards as a, a, a alternative to uh, capping emissions back in the, back in the noughties, as Richard uh, referred to them. Um, so anyway, thank you, Larry. I, uh, let, me, let me raise a question for Richard, speaking of Richard. Um, as I understand it, the Climate Change Act of 2000, whatever it was, eight, I think, was, con was a bipartisan action by, um, by the conservatives and labor at that time to uh, address climate change. And it's widely considered in the UK to be very successful. I wonder if you could tell us why it was embraced bipartisanly and why it's been successful. I think probably just great good fortune. You know, party discipline is much stronger in the UK than it is in the States. Uh, you know, MP, members of parliament do get deselected by their central party saying you are not allowed to be a conservative candidate anymore and so that is you know there's none of this sort of, I will stand in the primary and then go my own sweet way if I win the gerrymandered seat uh, that gives some people a certain degree of independence uh, and whether it just happens to be the leadership of the parties uh, you know, the happenstance of individuals, 
Uh, certainly there are some politicians, uh, typically those who think Brexit is an I a good idea, often also think that uh, climate science should be ignored. Uh, but the consensus has held and public opinion also tends to get enough of its information from reputable sources, despite the best efforts of some sections of our media. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, let me let me address this to uh, to Chris. And uh, uh, President Biden uh, recently, as you know, rescinded <clears throat> the Trump administration's reduction in the social cost of carbon, uh, which makes it now about fifty one dollars a ton, uh, um, more or less, of carbon dioxide. Historically, the uh, social cost of carbon has mostly been used in cost-benefit analysis of, of new regulations. Um, uh, it, it has not been much used for operational decisions, such as in fuel choice for electricity generation. So in, in, in terms of policy changes, can you see a way to use the social cost of carbon more effectively to incentivize uh, decarbonization? Well, I, I think the, the first use would be through a, a, a price on carbon, um, which would obviously require legislation. Um, but, you know, one vision of the world is that we adopt a, a tax and dividend plan where the tax starts at the social cost of carbon or at least somewhere close to it and quickly ramps to it. Um, that, I think, tends to be the the, the most efficient way to get carbon reductions, although there are certainly other uh, market failures that might require additional policies. Um, I'll also point to some recent work by Bob Litterman and, and Gernot Wagner that because of risk considerations uh, in their risk model, you'd actually wanna start a, a carbon tax at much higher than the social cost of carbon um, and get rid of a bunch of risk and then it falls over time. I, I like the paper. I think it's it 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 sort of it's it's it might paint us economists into even a a, a smaller smaller uh, corner that suggests um, even a less politically palatable uh, policy. A high price on carbon at first that that then falls. Um, so absent a price on carbon, um, I think it'll obviously it'll start to be used in a cost benefit analysis. Um, if there were a movement to adopt a, a national clean energy standard, uh, it would be used to calculate the benefits of such a standard. So um, I certainly see it being used. Uh, my preference would be to, to see it being used as an as a explicit price on, on carbon. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Steve, I've got a host of questions that... Um, I could put to you, but I'm, I'm going to just give you one, <laughs> and uh, there are others will come. But for decades, as you know, coal interests have, have been the, the main obstacle to uh, cleaning up emissions, whether it's with sulfur back some time ago, uh, local air pollution, uh, now carbon, um, and. It, there's very, very understandable reasons for that. And you mentioned those in your, in your presentation. Um, so what, what can be done to, to get us over this, this log jam? Uh, would it be uh, carrots that uh, we, we can provide to, to coal industry or such as you know, helping with a coal retirement fund? Uh, or training programs, or are sticks uh, a better way to proceed, or, or, or maybe a more effective way to, to avoid making a value judgment? Sticks like the carbon tax, which of course will uh, hit hard in the electric utility choice of fuel, uh, and put, put coal down, down the merit order. Yeah, so um, it, it's a complicated question because there are, uh, but I'm gonna answer um, uh, sort of pragmatically given all the feedback I've heard uh, primarily in Congress uh, just over the last month in testimony sessions and in, and in briefings. Uh, this is one of four briefings I'm doing today 
for, for, for instance. So there's just a lot of that uh, of, of interest in this area. First thing to remember is that let's, it, it's important to understand that coal doesn't mean fossil. And I know you know that, but everybody should keep that firmly in mind in the United States. The coal job losses that are coming, um, if the US were to implement the clean energy standard, for instance, and the price on carbon that we recommended would, would be immediate. Um, now, it would also be the case, they, they wouldn't lose them all, but there's a, there's a strong loss in coal jobs almost immediately. And, and uh, basically coal electricity is gone by 2030, providing enormous health benefit to the country rapidly that more than pays for the transition. In contrast, oil and gas jobs uh, last uh, longer. You can think of it as a decade of delay. And so there's a, there's a chance for policy to proactively address oil and gas jobs in a way that's much more difficult with coal jobs because coal jobs are already hemorrhaging, right? And, and so, so that's a really important distinction. The reason that oil and gas last longer is that the transport fleet doesn't electrify immediately for oil. And because as you build out renewable capacity, you need to retain our existing gas capacity to provide a firm source of power, right? As we're, you know, eventually we have to deal, deal with that, uh, uh, that, that firm capacity to carbonize that firm capacity too, but the gas per, uh, capacity provides it early on. So there's still demand for gas, right? With coal, um, it's also regionally specific. So inside Appalachia, there is a special problem that goes back many decades and for which coal is just, is, you know, is just one facet. But if you look at, for instance, what Senator Manchin says, who is after all from West Virginia and is the swing vote in the, in the Senate, what he wants is a series of incentives to bring other kinds of jobs into his state. And so this is consistent with the idea that, you know, if you, if you ask what happens to jobs nationally? Well, more jobs are created during the transition that are lost, but that doesn't help if you're in one of those concentrations of fossil jobs where your, your community is hollowed out, right? Um, uh, but what could you do about it? Well, most communities see an increase in jobs because wind and solar is after all distributed. So most communities gain their economic base and their employment base, but the fossil intensive communities lose. What is untethered? Well, the answer is a lot of industrial capacity, low carbon industrial capacity that we need to build is untethered geographically and could be, could be tethered to proactively address job losses or as part of a political deal, which might in fact even be the same thing. This is relatively easy on the Gulf Coast because CO2 disposal reservoirs are located in proximity and there's also an embryonic pipeline network to move captured CO2 from, you know, from industries that would do CCS. It's also conceivable in the Northern Midwest through Wyoming. Appalachia, you'd have to make a special case, right? You have to actually build uh, build a, a network, but that's what's being discussed in Washington right now: is um, is uh, incentives to bring industry in. One one thing I hear is that the uh, the quality of the jobs is quite different. Uh, the, union, the ones in the coal jobs in the Midwest are unionized, typically, so they're getting pretty reasonable pay. Whereas the renewables jobs are um, basically construction jobs. And Absolutely, really and, and so and so this is another problem for the coal communities. Now, for those communities that are just gaining net renewable jobs and aren't losing the fossil jobs, that's a net gain still. Our uh, committee spent quite a bit of time um, uh, on on the issue of, uh, of the quality of the jobs. And so this is one of the reasons why trading industrial jobs for fossil jobs is politically more palatable than saying incorrectly that fossil jobs can be replaced by renewables jobs. There's no location that has substantial fossil employment for which that's true. 
Okay, so uh, it's uh, it's ten o'clock in California. So let let's uh, sprinkle in some questions from from the from the audience here. And I would remind the audience that uh, put your question in the Q and A. We're not able to get to everybody's question because, as you can tell, each question takes takes about five minutes to get through. Um, but we'll we'll, we'll handle uh, some of these. So. Uh, First question is from Adrian Johnson, uh, and I, I don't know um, any more about uh, the affiliation of people and nor their honorific titles, but uh, pardon that. Uh, her question is that some well-intentioned policies such as net metering, that's, that's when you uh, have solar on your roof and it's just the, uh, the net amount of energy you draw from the grid, uh, you're charged for. Net metering has been shown to be regressive. What are some of the progressive, this may, may go to any of the, any people, but Steve perhaps in uh, particular, what are some of the progressive federal solutions to be done in the next 10 years aligned with enough for a uh, one and a half degrees C goal, um, which is, as you may recall was, um, it is a possible, well below two degrees is what Paris said. And there was no agreement on whether it's 1.5 or what well below meant. But anyway, 1.5 is often used. So Steve. Uh, yeah, so on the generic question of whether or not uh, US net zero by 2050 is, is, is uh, consistent with one and a half degrees. Uh, the net, net metering, net, 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 well, go ahead. Yeah, the, uh, the net metering question, I think um, uh, uh, Chris uh, or, or Richard um, uh, should really take a stab at it. Okay, the, we'll, we'll turn to them next. We'll answer that already in the chat. And the answer is, if we're lucky and the rest of the world uh, acts as well, and in, in the developing world, that might take some level of selflessness. And if we're unlucky, if the if we're at the upper end of climate sensitivity, then no. But but net zero in the U.S. by 2050 is broadly consistent with the statement that uh, the goal should be limiting warming to substantially less than two degrees Celsius. It's broadly consistent with that, given the uncertainty in the climate sensitivity. But you are not certain to get to one and a half degrees with any policy anyone has on the table, given the uncertainty in the climate sensitivity. We've already admitted too much to be certain about that. Yeah, the uncertainty in climate sensitivity. You should turn to a uh, to a policy expert. You know, I'm kind of a climate guy who's chairing a committee <laughs> of, of uh, policy experts. Yeah, I, re I remember the graph in one of the IPCCs of a probability of this density is for the climate sensitivity and uh, the doubling of CO2. You could get to 1.5, or you could get to 10 degrees. The uncertainty at that time was such. Well, it's not. It's not. It's not as high now, but not as high now. You can think about a doubling of CO two is between three and five degrees, right? Yeah, which is higher than it used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, so it used to be like one point five to four point five, I think. But anyway, let's let's turn to maybe Chris. Chris Knittel, do you have something to add to what are some uh, progressive uh, alternatives to net metering? Yeah, yeah, actually, would be consistent sure. With a, a 1.5. Uh, well, I'll 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 do the reverse of what Steve mentioned, and I'll punt on the 1.5 and just talk about progressive potential okay, there progressive we go. policies. Uh, but first, let me just spend 20 seconds beating up on net metering even more. Um, so um, you know, it's actually worse than we think with. Um, net metering and the regressivity of it. And, and it's for two, maybe three reasons. So one is we tend to subsidize rooftop solar. Uh, it tends to be wealthy people that put rooftop solar on their roofs. So the, the subsidies themselves are going uh, to wealthy people. But I've done some recent work with Scott Berger that I could put in the chat that looks at a second effect of regressivity, which is the way we price electricity is we tend to pay for the distribution and transmission systems through a volumetric charge, right? So um, we charge say six cents a kilowatt hour to pay for the distribution system, even though that's largely a fixed cost that doesn't depend on how many kilowatt hours or kilowatts are running through the system. 
But so what that means though, with, with policies like net metering and solar uh, more generally is that when I put a rooftop solar on my roof, I'm getting the full benefit, not just the how much I'm saving the system on the energy side, but I'm also getting this volumetric benefit uh, that used to go to pay for the transmission and distribution, and now I don't pay for. But those costs, because they're fixed, have to go to some somewhere. So what you have to do now is raise the volumetric charge for everyone that didn't put rooftop solar on their roof. So what we do in that paper is show the magnitude of that second regressivity effect, and it, and it can be quite quite large. Um, so one thing that's more progressive that we could do to undo that second effect is to start having larger connection charges uh, for our electricity system. So price energy based on what that those costs are, which are a volumetric cost to the system, but price or pay for transmission and distribution through fixed charges or lump sum fees. And then you could even make that more progressive by having that means tested in some way where low income households pay a, a smaller connection charge than wealthy households. So that's the first thing. The other thing is that we need to find a way for low income households who many of whom don't have roofs to share in this rooftop solar uh, uh, phenomenon. And that can operate through more policies for what's called community solar where low income households can pay into uh, solar farms and get some of the benefits that uh, the wealthy households are able to get because of all the subsidies for, for solar. Yeah, that's very, very helpful. Um, in fact, more thinking on, on those lines might be very, very beneficial and very actionable. Could, could I ask just a quick follow up on that? Our committee discussed at length community ownership of say renewable asset. There are a lot of communities that own substantial vacant land. And some of these aren't even rural like Detroit, for instance. And the, the, the idea that a municipality would capture revenue that it would use to fund local government is one that is really quite progressive. And so could you talk a little bit about that? We've, we've looked at policies like that at, 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 some, at some length. Yeah, well, that would certainly, so the advantage of something like that, and the key advantage to uh, utility scale or larger scale solar installations is the costs are sometimes cut in half, right? So um, I didn't rail on rooftop solar for that reason, but it's a very expensive way to get solar electrons into the system. So right away, you would get a ben benefits from that. Um, I would certainly advocate a local community thinking along those lines rather than subsidizing rooftop solar because you would get the community wide benefits. They'd meet, be more dispersed across the whole community and you would get the cost savings associated with, with that. And poor people get better services out of the deal. Right, right. Although I'd point out that community solar is not always for poor people. My colleague, sure. in, right. colleague in Maine is in a bunch of townhomes with yeah. other retired people and they, uh, setting aside a few acres of their community property for, for a community solar project. Yeah. Because um, the roofs won't handle it. Okay, so uh, let, me, let, me, let me have a question here for, um, uh, for Richard Green, actually anybody, but R Richard comes to mind, but it could be uh, anybody else who wants to try, try it. It's from uh, Repu Damon uh, Malhotra. Sorry for the butchering of the, of the pronunciation, but nuclear power plants are shutting down across the world. Some due to cost concerns, and some due to public opposition, and many to both. On the other hand, modular nuclear reactors might provide a much needed baseload energy supply in a 100% renewable world. I think the, the main point is, is innovation in renewable may work out, maybe it would, maybe it won't, maybe it will. And the question is, uh, should nuclear energy should be part of the decarbonization process? It certainly does get you a slug of rather useful baseload. Uh, now, having too much baseload isn't so helpful if you then have a lot of variable renewable energy without storage, 
uh, but with adequate storage and potentially the ability to ramp down the nuclear stations, which is something that the French have been able to do for years. It's not completely efficient. If you do it too much, it makes the it does use up fuel. So there are limits to what you can do, but you can do it a bit. Uh, so nuclear can be a useful part of the mix. In the UK, there are definitely a substantial minority of people who don't like nuclear power, but it does tend to be a minority. And we've got one reactor under construction at the moment and others being seriously considered if only they can get the costs down uh, and looking at different contracting arrangements to try to reduce the risk and the cost of capital. So it's certainly part of the mix being used in Britain. Yeah, the French are very behind nuclear power, the Germans are opposed to it. So it's a very, very heterogeneous picture, I think. Absolutely. Anybody have any anything else they want to add to that? I guess okay. I that most, yeah, most um, proposals for getting to net zero um, do try to extend the lifetime of our existing nuclear fleet, even if the destination is 100% renewable with no nukes in the end. In other words, uh, you know, those nukes, once you build them, are cheap to keep running. <laughs> and if we can extend their lifetime, uh, that's an asset. Yeah. And you know, the only thing I would add to that is, um, and with a, <clears throat> a bunch of economists on, I'm sure we'll all agree that we, we really want a level playing field. And if nuclear can, can compete, which, you know, we haven't been good at building nuclear, but um, other countries have. Uh, then we should allow it to compete. So we shouldn't build a system that some, somehow penalizes nuclear. Um, it's certainly, you know, the Fukushima accident was a catastrophe, but I often try to remind policymakers of the thousands of coal mining deaths uh, associated with all of our coal power. So uh, nuclear has, has both carbon, carbon benefits for sure and potentially health benefits. Fully, fully agree. Go ahead, Larry. Fully agree with the with the goal of leveling the playing field, but what, what makes it especially difficult in the nuclear case is it's not always easy to know what level. It's so difficult to assess the risks. Not a disagreement about that. Yep. That's very true. That's very true. Uh, but you know, we should also remember that uh, uh, and this is an agnostic statement that. When we talk about nuclear, we tend to think of the ones, the, the design that was in the US that was perfected in the 1950s, because the last nuclear power plant that was ordered was in the early 1970s. Um, but techno technological change and innovation could change what we think of as a nuclear power plant, or maybe not. But uh, perhaps the uh, Aversion should be to the nuclear power power that we that we know, and not necessarily to uh, what may come in the future, if we're if we're going to have an aversion. Okay, um, let me uh, turn to uh, um, question by uh, Martin Homek. Uh, we might expect to see a change in living and working conditions caused by the COVID pandemic. Or some other concerns. I, you know, I think we're all wondering, you know, what's going to happen to cities once uh, people um, fall in love with zooming. Although I'm sure we'll all be glad to put zooming aside um, once this thing is over. But we don't know what's going to happen. So the question is, do you think um, these changes may affect distributed energy resources, electric vehicles? Uh, transmission expansion policies, other things we're talking about, which are sort of based on the way we've uh, we've seen the world uh, pre-COVID. So, uh, anybody want to take a take a shot at that, Larry? You look you got a smiling face. <laughs> uh, I just say the one obvious dimension where I think there'll be big changes. The boondoggles that we academics take uh, to, to do a lot of international level. I think we've learned that uh, we have to admit that um, 
it's a little bit hard to justify the carbon footprints of a lot of our travel. And I, you know, air travel is a major contributor to CO2 emissions. It may not just be from academics. I think there's going to be a significant reduction there. Uh, I don't have the estimates as to what might be the extent, but I think that'll be one channel that, uh, where the footprint is much less than what we have, would have predicted a year or two ago. Yeah, the, the only one I would add to uh, that, and that's a great point, Larry, but um, in principle, uh, electric vehicles have a big upfront investment and then um, a, a smaller marginal cost of driving. So electric vehicles are more attractive the more miles you drive. And if we're actually doing more telecommuting and not driving as many miles, of course we could downsize the batteries, but um, that doesn't work for the weekend trips as well. So it might be, uh, it might reduce the, the diffusion of EVs. I don't think it's gonna be a big effect, but directionally, I think that's the way it would go. EVs, I think, are, are betting on innovation, reducing the cost of batteries. Everybody that drives an EV thinks they're terrific, just expensive. And uh, so far, the uh, innovation in, in energy storage is uh, a bright spot on the horizon, not only for end users, but also for utility storage. So. Uh, let me, let me ask uh, another question from, this one is from uh, Jeff Byron. I think it's to, uh, J uh, to Richard. And congratulations to the UK for an extraordinary reduction on CO2 emissions in such a short time and for providing an excellent example for other countries, uh, hopefully ones that have a coal industry you can get rid of. Uh, the Green uh, Staffel paper is excellent in analyzing what has transpired. How much the CO2 reduction do you think is directly attributable to policy changes versus market forces? That's a great question. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for the comment. If I may, I'll just share my screen there and jump to the key slide. So uh, the, we've got 110 million tonnes roughly to explain. 40 million tonnes of that was subsidised renewables, wind, solar and biomass. And I've just realised so I'm not showing you the pointer, wind, solar and uh, biomass. Uh, 30 mil 20 million tonnes came from the carbon prices and 10 million tonnes came from dealing with sulphur emissions. So that's a total of 70 fuel prices gave us another 10. So that's clearly not a policy change. Uh, fuel prices are set in world or at least European markets uh, for coal and for gas. Uh, and then demand was about 20 million tonnes. And that's some unknown mixture of policy to reduce demand, the impact perhaps of higher carbon prices, uh, working through demand elasticity, but overall the wholesale price didn't change that much in this period. Possibly renewable subsidies would have pushed demand down a bit, but I would say, you know, this isn't a paper that goes all out on, we want to get the causation, I'm afraid. This is just attributing or sort of looking at the impacts of these actual changes rather than some of the things that drove those changes. And, but I would say 70 out of 110 is pretty clearly policy changes that wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had those policies. Thanks. And thank you very much for the comment. Thank you. So we, we have another question here from, this is a um, question from several people, Alessia Kochetkova and Gianluca Rimini. <clears throat> Um, how can we develop an effective and reliable CO2 accounting system that allows us to embrace a sufficiently large share of a different set of activities and processes related to our consumption? You know, we, we hear often the solution to climate change is to make everybody a vegetarian. So what, what but that's, that's, that's an example of a change in consumption. What can we do to address 
changes in consumer preferences. So that's that's a rather difficult question to address. Um, would anybody like to tackle it? Well, I'll just say two things. One is that one thing that's nice about CO2, believe it or not, or carbon emissions is that in most cases, you know how much emissions will come if you know what the carbon content is of the original fuels. So therefore an upstream carbon tax, which is relatively easy to administer, you put the tax on at that point in the supply chain, then in some sense you have created the, the needed changes in downstream prices to change consumer behavior. So it, it kind of handles the accounting uh, to some degree or to a large degree. Uh, the supply chain doesn't always work that way perfectly, but I think to a first approximation, that's a really nice attraction of uh, carbon taxes, the proportionality of carbon content to its ultimate emissions. But the second thing I want to say is, I think in the question there was a point, or maybe Charlie, you mentioned it, about changes in preferences. And there really is an issue of changing norms, which goes beyond policy. The government can perhaps do things to, through information to change individuals' preferences so that conditional on whatever policy might be in place, there still is an even greater tendency to make substitutions or changes in living standards. We've seen examples of that in the past. Uh, to a large extent, the change in norm toward recycling, where it's now a habit by so many households, vast majority households, it isn't uh, directly due to changes in prices or policy. But rather, it's become, it's, it's become a change in, in norms. So I do think as a complement to the kinds of policies that we've been talking about today, there is really the issue of information and job owning, which hopefully can also uh, uh, engage the, the, the norms channel. Thank you. So uh, we have a, another question from uh, Jeremy Platt. Uh, this is uh, to Chris. Uh, the hockey stick which you mentioned, seems to have been missing from setting a CO2 reduction goal. Might less, ambition, might less ambition bring far greater social benefit uh, participation, both nationally and globally? Yeah, so this links to the discussion we had about the social cost of carbon. Um, if we knew the social cost of carbon, then that would tell us how far up that marginal abatement hockey stick curve we should go. Um, whether or not these 100% decarbonization goals are aspirational or real goals uh, is actually going to be the topic of uh, a webinar, a CEPR webinar in, in a couple of weeks. Um, I like to somewhat joke, but somewhat seriously say that rarely is zero and 100% the right answer. <laughs> um, usually there's some interior, interior solution. Um, so I don't know, you know, I, it, it's certainly the case that and some modeling work that we're, we've done at MIT, you know, those last few grams of CO2 that you're squeezing out of the CO2, uh, out of the electricity system can cost a million dollars a ton, right? Um, in some of these model runs. Um, so I, I do think as we approach 100%, um, society or policymakers are gonna have to, you know, think hard as to how far up that hockey stick we wanna go. Could I come in? Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the UK target talks about net zero for that very point yeah. that uh, the last bit of decarbonizing various things will be very difficult. And although I'm certainly enjoying having less jet lag than the last time I talked at Stanford, uh, the you know, the aviation is one of those things, uh, and therefore if we can use biomass with carbon capture or other technologies to take carbon out of the atmosphere, that allows some residual emissions. I think the problem with anything except zero is that my limited amount understanding of the physics is if it's not zero, it just means we get to move Miami a few decades later, which might it might be that the postponement is felt worthwhile by us. I don't know about the people a few decades later. 
Also, it's useful to point out that um, net zero goals for the globe by 2050 using current IPCC global warming potentials will actually result in falling atmospheric CO2 concentrations because the land and ocean sinks continue to operate. And also in a cooling planet, particularly as the methane emissions equilibrate to a new lower level, right? And so, because methane's short-lived, so it equilibrates, doesn't build up, right, in the same way. So the, the, the temperature goals already include cooling forcing in the planet, all right? And so weakening them further leads you, uh, uh, you know, towards Miami underwater <clears throat> in the way that you just described, right? It's already really stringent. In other words, net zero by 2050 is not net zero uh, change in forcing, all right? That's the point. Okay, we, we have uh, about five minutes left and I have uh, a couple of questions. So let's see if we can get to the, get to the two of them. Um, Steve, uh, outside of the US and uh, including the US and Europe, uh, NIMBY issues and other obstacles impede renewables and new transmission. Uh, what public policies can remedy this? Yeah, I, how, do you, how do you solve NIMBY? Yeah, I, I mean, I actually believe that um, this is where the consumer preferences matter the most, right? It, it's, it's in opposition to the massive transformation, for example, of the landscape that we're talking about. Uh, our group took a, a, a substantive look at decreasing uh, US demand for uh, energy services and decided that it was impractical, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I mean, other than to, and that's why for, unless, you know, except forcing people to buy heat pumps with a manufacturing standard and, and uh, the electrification of the vehicle fleet is just, you know, it's electric cars are better, they're faster and everything else, right? But in general, if you ask an American to do with less, I think they get mad at you, right? And, and, but, but on the other hand, I think that public opposition to <clears throat> is serious and the baked in Byzantine regulatory and permitting structure we have, particularly for electricity transmission, but also for projects in general is, is, is prohibitive. So we propose a whole series of very granular changes in the way that permitting and, and regulation is done, particularly of the electrical system. And these include some very, very difficult politically um, uh, legislative changes in the National Power Acts. There are two big power acts that actually need to be amended, we think. And to transfer, for instance, to FERC, right, which is an agency that does this sort of thing, the authority to plan interstate you know, transmission routes, for instance. I think without that, we're in trouble, frankly. Uh, or I think we end up with a system that costs a lot more, all right? And also that, um, that green certainly would oppose, right? Because you don't get as much renewable electricity. So I'll leave it at that. Outside the United States, I don't know about consumer um, uh, behavior uh, so much, but, but um, I think that there is some substantial evidence that the nature-based solutions, the land side, the sinks that we were talking about, which are sort of 20% of the whole solution and a lot of it concentrated in developing countries, that their land tenure practices are much more, and, and sort of traditional practices that govern the way land is used, make, um, make the response to um, incentives, economic incentives, extremely difficult to predict. I think most people who study this don't think we know how well price incentives will be adopted in these countries. I'm glad you addressed the, uh, the NIMBY problem because it's been, it's been with us for a long time. Uh, I remember in Spain, the uh, lot of opposition to citing windmills on the top of ridges around the country. So I think it's in a lot of places. Well, we've, uh, <clears throat> we've run out of uh, time. Uh, let me um, thank all the presenters and the audience. So um, 
just closing, uh, it's now 1030 in California. I just wanted to say that in two weeks, March 31st, we have another uh, webinar focusing this time on storage. Uh, a big group of people at, at Stanford, particularly in the engineering side, working on uh, storage. Uh, this will be this webinar will be moderated by William Chu, um, material science, and uh, will be the same same format as we had today, but a different topic. But thank you everyone for joining us, and um, uh, have a wonderful rest of your day, or or sleep sleep well. Thank you. Thank you.